My name is Lindsay Barclay and I will be presenting on the applied biomechanics of an ice hockey slap shot. The three concepts I will be focusing on are strain or deformation of the hockey stick, impulse, and linear velocity. One of the measurements that I will be conducting is linear velocity. There are six phases of an ice hockey slap shot, the backswing, downswing, preloading, loading, release, and follow through. I will be describing these in the following slides. During the backswing, the rotation of the torso, shoulders, arms, and hips help to transfer momentum during the swing. During the downswing, the player swings the stick towards the puck, unwinding and sending that momentum they built up in the backswing towards the puck. This phase occurs when the stick makes contact with the ice or the practice surface as shown in this picture and bends, starting to store the potential energy that will later be transferred to the puck. The loading phase occurs when the stick comes in contact with the puck and it bends, transferring some of the stored energy from the preloading phase. When the puck is released from stick contact, the transfer of energy is complete and the puck moves in the direction of the force. In this last phase, the player follows through to allow continuous motion of the stick toward their desired target. The first concept I will be discussing is strain. In hockey terms, we call this stick deformation. There are several things that come into play when we talk about deformation. The first is flex number. Flex number is the amount of weight in pounds that it takes to bend the stick one inch. For example, a stick that has a flex number of 80 will require 80 pounds of force to bend it by one inch. The bending of the stick allows it to store potential energy. As the stick strikes the puck and returns to its original shape, the energy from the stick is transferred to the puck. Elite hockey players are able to generate much faster slap shots because they can flex the hockey stick more than recreational players. The recreational player shown here is using a stick with a flex number of 85, meaning that it takes 85 pounds to create a deformation of 1 inch. While the flex number of the professional on the right is unknown, we can see a large amount of deformation which will result in a greater amount of potential energy transferred from the stick to the puck. According to Brian Polson's article, The Slap Shot and the Science Behind It, an elite player maintains about 38 milliseconds of blade-to-puck contact, whereas a recreational player is only able to maintain an average of 27 milliseconds of blade-to-puck contact. This increased contact period allows more time for energy transfer. This visual depicts the average percentage of time spent in bend and recoil during puck-to-blade contact for elite and recreational hockey players. We can see that the rec player spends 18.2% of puck-to-blade contact in the bend stage and less than or equal to 35.4% in recoil. This can be compared to the 28.8% of time in the bend stage and 59.8% in recoil for the elite athlete. Another aspect of this graph that is important is the no stick shaft deflection seen in the first 46.4% of the recreational player's contact time. This suggests that the recreational player spent 46.4% of blade to puck contact time with no bend in the stick at all, leading to a slower and lower potential energy transfer. This slow motion video from the Smarter Everyday YouTube channel shows how a hockey stick bends during a slap shot. This deformation allows potential energy to be stored in the stick when it strikes the ice before making puck contact. This energy is then released into the puck like a slingshot, sending it forward in the direction of force.
In this video, the amount of loading on the stick became too much for it to handle. The first load came from stick to ice contact, and the second came when the stick made contact with the puck. The strain and deformation became so large that the stick was not able to return to its original shape. This is seen quite often in NHL games. The second concept I will be discussing is impulse. Impulse has a direct relationship with force and time. On the equation shown on the right, the left side of the equation shows impulse, force times time. With a greater force, we have a greater change in momentum, leading to a greater final velocity of the puck. With increased stick deformation, there is a greater time of stick to puck contact. As a whole, all of these variables will increase velocity of the puck. The third concept I will be discussing and the measurement that I will be calculating later is linear velocity. Linear velocity is influenced by several factors. Puck impulse, initial and final stick velocity, stick stiffness, amount of stick deformation, forces exerted by the player, and stick length. In order to calculate linear velocity, we will take angular velocity and stick length or radius and multiply those together. The goal, of course, is to generate as much linear velocity as possible, which will lead to an increased speed of the shot and increase your likelihood that the goalie will not block your shot. The first aspect of linear velocity that I will be discussing is angular velocity. Angular velocity is the change in angle over time. With increase in size of the angle between the stick and the ice, we have an increase in angular velocity. The radius or the length of a stick plays a very important role in the linear velocity of a slap shot. The optimum stick length is from the ice to somewhere between the player's chin and nose. A longer stick will result in a greater linear velocity. You might wonder, if a longer stick will result in a greater linear velocity, why wouldn't a player want the longest hockey stick available to him or her? The answer to this question is all about the player's ability to control the stick. A longer stick, while it might have a greater linear velocity outcome, will have a larger mass and a larger radius of gyration. Both of these variables will increase the moment of inertia, making it harder for the player to rotate the stick effectively and have full control over their shot. In this case, size does matter. The stick used in this video is 55 inches in length with a flex number of 50. Using the length of the stick, we can say that the radius, or the length from the axis of rotation, is 55 inches. In order to determine linear velocity, we must calculate angular velocity and divide that by the radius. I used the Canovia software to analyze the change in angle from the top of the backswing to puck contact. Using Canovia, I was able to analyze the video on the previous slide and I am now able to calculate linear velocity. I started by converting the radius of 55 inches to 1.397 meters. To calculate angular velocity, I took the change in angle from the top of the backswing to the angle of the stick at puck contact and divided that by 367 milliseconds, which was the duration of the entire shot. This gave me an angular velocity of 0.35 degrees per millisecond. 
I converted this to radians per second in order to use it in the linear velocity equation more easily. The linear velocity comes out to be 8.52 meters per second or 19.1 miles per hour. While this may seem slow for the most powerful shot in hockey, it is reasonable considering that the athlete measured was a recreational athlete and not a professional hockey player. The average slap shot speed in the NHL is about 80 to 93 miles per hour. The fastest slap shot ever recorded was 108.8 miles per hour by Zidino Chara of the Boston Bruins. While there are many aspects of biomechanics that can be applied to analyze a slap shot in ice hockey, the main three that I focused on were deformation or strain, impulse, and linear velocity. As shown previously, slap shot linear velocity is influenced by several factors. The two that I focused on, however, were stick length or radius and angular velocity. Players should be well aware of which flex number works best for them and how to train in order to create the most efficient slap shot that will ultimately lead to scoring goals. Although I learned a lot from this research, I now have more questions that can be used in further research. For example, do professional hockey players have a clear understanding of how flex number and deformation influence their slap shot effectiveness? For example, if players are asked about their stick preference, will experts be able to use the data specific to that player to determine which stick, based on the qualities of its mechanics, will enhance their performance the most? And secondly, can we use this analysis to spot areas for improvement if a player begins to have difficulty with their performance? This type of analysis can be used in other sports as well, and because it has the ability to show subtle changes, athletes can see what changes they should make in order to improve their performance.